Aren't you glad to know that? I want to encourage you with the word from Revelation chapter 15. It says of the Lord, great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God, the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. We have seen his righteous acts. We have seen that he indeed is Lord of lords and King of kings. And so we can say with all assurance that it is well, it is fine, it is good, because the Lord is on his side. So we're going to invite you to sing this classic hymn to celebrate that it is well, no matter what we face or where we find ourselves. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea like to welcome you today to the online experience of Lizella Baptist Church and uh, I hope and pray that you are safe and sane and healthy and uh, this is our third week in a row to come to you uh, online and uh, I'm gonna tell you folks I can't put into words how much I miss you and uh, how much I long to see you and uh, I'm preaching now to an empty sanctuary, but my heart longs for the day 
uh, when this place is filled with people again and I'm able to uh, fellowship with you and to shake your hands and to hug your necks and just to laugh with you. And I have missed, I have so missed our church uh, family gathering together for corporate worship. But I am thankful to be able to come to you today through the technology uh, of being online. And so uh, I'm grateful to share God's word with you. So wherever you're at today, whether it's in your living room, uh, your dining room, on your front porch or your back porch, we welcome you today to the online service of Lizella Baptist Church. In case if you missed uh, last week's live stream, I started a new three-week series called Victory. Last week, we looked at how we can have victory over the world, and uh, today, I want us to talk about how we can have victory over sin, and then next week on Easter Sunday, I want us to look at how to have victory over death. And so, if you have your Bibles with you, uh, I'd like for you to turn to John chapter 19, and I'll begin reading in verse 16. Uh, John chapter 19, beginning in verse 16, says this. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. And so the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. And there they crucified him with the two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. Verse 25, near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there, the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, woman, here's your son. And to the disciple, he said, here's your mother. And from that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Later, knowing that everything uh, had been finished so that the scripture had been fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. And a jar of wine vinegar was there, and so they soaked a sponge in it, and they put the sponge on the stalk of a hyssop plant. They lifted it to the lips of Jesus, and when he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. And with that, he bowed his head, and he gave up his spirit. Today is what we commonly call Palm Sunday. It's the Sunday in which we commemorate the fact that Jesus rode uh, triumphantly into the city of Jerusalem. And throughout this week, we call this week Holy Week, in which we remember and honor and celebrate Friday that Jesus died for us, and Sunday he was raised to life again. You cannot talk about having abundant victory over sin without talking about the price that Jesus paid to give us that victory. Our ability to live in victory cost Jesus everything. Dwight Eisenhower famously said, there are no victories at discounted prices. I don't believe any of us could ever fathom the torment and the distress and the agony that Jesus suffered on the cross. Verse 16 said, finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. And so the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull. And there they crucified him with the two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. Now bear in mind, 2,000 years ago, crucifixion was a common event in Rome In particular, the the crucifixion was invented by the Persians uh, several hundred years before Jesus was born, and then the Romans kept it in place as a form of execution 300 years after Jesus died, until finally Constantine, who was the first Christian emperor, said this is too barbaric an execution. And so it was the Persians who invented crucifixion, but it was the Romans who perfected it. At the time that John wrote this gospel account, crucifixions were happening by the thousands. In fact, thousands were crucified annually in Rome. And that's probably why none of the gospel writers really give a lot of the gory details about the death of Jesus because the audience that John was writing to already knew the details. 
They had all seen crucifixions live and up close and in person. Oftentimes when a person would be sentenced to death by crucifixion, they would be placed on the busiest streets to be crucified because the Roman officials wanted people to know this is what happens when you defy us and disobey us. And so that's why very little detail is given concerning the death of Jesus. And here's what's interesting to me. If you think about it, the overwhelming emphasis of the New Testament is not the birth of Jesus. Even the overwhelming emphasis of the New Testament is not even the life of Jesus. The overwhelming emphasis of the New Testament is the death and the resurrection and the profound impact that these two milestones have on the child of God. When the Apostle Paul, who wrote half of the New Testament, he mentions very little about the sermons that Jesus preached. He mentions very little about the parables that Jesus taught. He mentions very little about the miracles that Jesus performed. He mentions very little about the places that Jesus went. He mentions very little about the friends that Jesus made. The primary focus and emphasis of Paul's writing is the death, the burial, the suffering, and the resurrection of Jesus. And there's a reason for that. The death of Jesus and his resurrection were the highlight events of his life. If you think about it this way, every person that's ever been born is born to live. Jesus is the only person who's ever been born who was born to die. That's what it says in Matthew chapter 20. Jesus said, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. John chapter 10 verse 18, Jesus said, no one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down and the authority to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. And so death was not the end of Jesus' life. Death was the work of his life. It's amazing to me how many Christians, they know where Jesus died outside of Jerusalem. They know how Jesus died by crucifixion. They know when Jesus died around 30 AD, but not many Christians really understand why Jesus died. And so as we approach Good Friday and Easter Sunday, I want to give you two reasons that Jesus died on the cross. Number one, Jesus died to be our substitute. Jesus did not go to the cross to be our example. Jesus went to the cross to be our substitute. His death on the cross is all about substitution. Now, if you think about it, a substitute is one who stands in the place of another. That's precisely what Jesus did for us. Jesus lovingly, humbly, willingly took our place as a substitute on the cross. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 says this, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but was made alive in the spirit. That's what Jesus did. He was the perfect one who died for imperfect ones. He was the just one who died for unjust ones. He was the sinless one who died for sinful ones. You see, my friends, we're all sinners. We're all sinners by nature. We're sinners by birth and we're sinners by practice. The cross was made for us, but Jesus took the cross upon himself. His death was a substitutionary death. He represented you and he represented me on that cross. It was the Roman soldier who nailed him to the cross. It was our sins who placed him on the cross. But it was his love that held him on that cross. Jesus was our substitute. He took our punishment. Everything that you've ever done wrong, everything that I've ever done wrong, everything that we'll ever do wrong, Jesus took upon himself on that cross. He died to be our substitute. But I want you to see, secondly, that Jesus died on the cross to conquer sin once and for all. Because of sin's uh, 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 reign in our life and the grip that it has on us, Jesus died on the cross to be the substitutionary death that you and I should have died. And so this grip of sin no longer has a hold on us. 
Listen to Romans chapter 5, verse 17 and 18. It says, For if by the trespass of one man, talking about Adam, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in the life of the one man, Jesus? And so consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. See, those verses tell us that Adam's sin brought condemnation to us all. But the one act of Jesus on the cross brought freedom over sin to everyone who is a child of God. That means today, if, you, if you've never received Jesus into your heart, today you can turn from your sin, you can believe the gospel, you can turn to the Savior, you can trust Jesus as your Lord, and you'll be made a brand new person. And if you're made a brand new person, you're given a brand new power. His presence gives us the power to conquer things that we could not conquer on our own. When Jesus gives us victory over sin, he gives us the ability to say no to things that we previously could not say no to. Jesus gives us the supernatural ability to say no to temptation. Jesus gives us the supernatural ability to overcome addictions. The presence and the power of Jesus gives us the supernatural ability to break strongholds and to end addictions. That's uh, not to say that you're not ever going to sin, but now because of the power and the presence of Jesus, you now have the power to not sin. You now have the power to make the choice to turn from your sins. Before you didn't have that choice, before you were stuck because willpower was not enough. Listen to what God's word said in Romans chapter 6, verse 10 and 11. The death that Jesus died, he died to sin once and for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God in the same way. Count yourself dead to sin, but alive to God in Jesus. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24 says that he bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. My friend, the reason that Jesus died on the cross was to be our substitute. The reason that Jesus died on the cross is to allow us, to empower us to conquer sin once and for all. And so the best news that I can give you on this Palm Sunday is if you're a child of God, you have been set free from your sins. You are now dead to sin and you're alive in Jesus. Listen to the words of Colossians chapter 2. Verse 13 and 14 in this scripture is so powerful. Verse 13, Colossians chapter 2 says, When you were dead in your sins, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all of our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He's taken it away, nailing it to the cross. See, here's what that means. In the first century, when in the Roman world, whenever a person would commit a crime and they would be arrested and they would be sentenced, they would receive, as a result of that sentencing, prison time. And when they went into prison, they carried with them a certificate of indebtedness. This certificate had on it a list of all the crimes that they had committed. And this list, this certificate would be displayed on the prison door in which they had their sentence. And once this, they paid their debt to society for their crimes, this certificate of indebtedness would be rolled up, listen, and, and a Roman seal would seal that certificate with the word to telesti, which means it is finished, which means they completed their debt. They paid their debt. Their crimes had then been forgiven and paid in full. Verse 13, let me read this again. Knowing this, says, when you were dead in your sins, God made you alive in Christ. 
he forgave us of all of our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He's taken it away, nailing it to the cross. God the Father took our certificate of indebtedness that was caused by our sin and our disobedience and God nailed those sins to the cross with the Lord Jesus and once those sins were paid by the shedding of his precious blood, Jesus cried out, it is finished, to telestai, which means it is paid, the debt is canceled. The best news that I could give you on this Lord's day is if you're a child of God, your debt has been paid in full by the Lord Jesus. You are free. You don't have to be enslaved by your past for another day. You don't have to be shackled by your mistakes. Jesus took all of those things, every sin that you've ever committed, every sin that you will ever commit, and God nailed them to the cross with the Lord Jesus. And he's given you a certificate of indebtedness that says paid in full. You now have the victory over your sin. Jesus did for us what we could not do for ourselves. And through his death on the cross, we're offered today the free gift of salvation. By his grace, he canceled the penalty of our sins. But you must trust him to do so. And if you'll ask Jesus today, if you'll trust in your heart that he's your Lord and Savior... Jesus will free you from all of your sins, and today you can walk in victory. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for the assurance that you have forgiven us, that you have freed us, that you have given us victory over our sins. We're no longer held in bondage to our past, but Lord, we've been given a certificate of indebtedness that says on it, to die, paid in full. And Lord Jesus, we thank you for that. May we live in freedom, the freedom that cost you so much. May we revel in it and enjoy it. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. So as Chris just very eloquently explain the gospel. I was reminded of not too long ago when I was on an aircraft flying and there was a Jewish lady sitting beside me. We had a great conversation, but she shocked me with a question when she asked, don't you guys believe that the Jews killed Jesus? While I was shocked, I quickly responded and said, no, no one killed Jesus. Jesus chose to lay his life down on the cross for our sins. He could have called in legions of angels to take care of his enemies and prohibited them from crucifying him on that cross, but he did not. He willingly laid down his life because he loves us so much that he wants to allow us the opportunity to be with him in heaven forever. We're all sinners and we're all in need of a savior. And that savior is Jesus Christ, our Lord. If you'd like to make a a profession of faith this morning, I would ask you to just follow along with me as I pray this prayer and, uh, and know that Jesus wants to come into your heart and save you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I come before you and I admit that I'm a sinner and I'm in need of a savior. Lord, I ask you to come into my heart and save my soul. Lord, I believe that when you died on that cross, you paid the penalty of my sin. And I believe that you gave me your righteousness and allow me to be reborn so that I could be with you in heaven forever. I ask you to come into my heart and be the Lord of my life. And then, dear Lord, I ask you to give me the strength and courage to make a public profession of that faith and to seek out those that might help me to grow in my faith and learn more about you and how to walk in your grace. Lord, I thank you so much for saving me. And now I ask this in Christ's name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, congratulations and welcome to the family of God. And I, we want to encourage you and help you in your relationship with Christ. And we just ask that uh, you contact us 
uh, either through our church website or uh, call our number, uh, 478-935-8632. And we'd love to give you some resources, material, and help you grow in your faith and help you grow in your understanding of Jesus. God bless you.